Hi, I'm Dr. Jean O'Brien, Associate Professor in the Department of Urology and Male Infertility at the University of Rochester. Since I've come on to the faculty at the University of Rochester Medical Center over the past several years, I've noticed that my schedule has become uh, a lot more packed with men seeking evaluation for infertility. It used to be specifically male factor infertility. It was defined as a, a condition in which a couple were trying to conceive and within six to twelve months of trying they were unable to conceive a child and so they were referred to a specialist. And it's typically defined as a lower sperm count in the male, uh, potentially associated with a lower testosterone level. Since then that classification has really been redefined because it, you know, a lot of couples are figuring out that it, in some ways it's a bit easier to evaluate the male as opposed to the female partner in the couple. And so um, they'll, the man will come to see me often as early as three to four months after attempting conception. And, um, I, and I think that's perfectly okay. It does give us a very objective idea of where they stand. And the way I explain this to my patients is that uh, a man is made every three months he has a complete turnover of a generation of sperm and you have millions of sperm being made every day and sperm are just protein packages they are DNA and so DNA just by nature the fact that it is protein and disulfide bonds so it's just a whole bunch of stuff twisted together it is going to be prone to error so 75 percent of the sperm that are made every day look funny they just don't work, they don't look good. So morphology is a definition of how the sperm look. And so if you expect the majority of the sperm to look abnormal, then you, then you can imagine you have to have a lot of sperm to make up for all the funny looking ones. There are theories out there that male factor infertility has been just on the rise. And certain studies in Europe have suggested that it's increasing by 10 to 20 fold. And the theory is that it has a lot to do with environmental exposures because some of the changes we see in terms of uh, lower sperm counts and that type of thing have happened too quickly for it to be a generational, to be explained by just time alone. There are a lot of theories of, out there about environmental toxins playing a role, whether those environmental toxins are in the air, in the food that we eat, in the beverages that we consume. And, um, or the uh, products that we use to store those beverages and foods. I you know a lot of research and focus has been on phthalates, which are plasticizers. Anything that has that shower curtain smell has plasticizers or phthalates in it. So water bottles, disposable water bottles have phthalates in them. Those um, soap containers that are soft that you use in the washrooms, those all have plasticizers in them. And there's a theory that uh, those plasticizers or phthalates actually have um, a hormonal component to them that increase the female hormone in a man's body and may affect the way that the sperm are produced and the way that they look. In addition, in foods and beverages we eat, a lot of the meat and vegetables that we eat have um, potentially been treated with antibiotics or even hormones in order to speed maturation. So if a cow is given, an, is given a hormone in order to speed its growth, and have it produce more meat, and it works, and then someone eats that meat, you can't assume that that hormone is gone. It's Where is it gonna be stored? It's gonna be stored in tissue, which is what muscle is. And so the environmental impact, whether we consume it, we put it on our bodies, or we touch it, can be huge. Now, that's not to cause widespread panic or anything, but it just used, I just tell my patients to just follow some kind of common sense steps. Um, you know, as much as you can, you want to use free range, organically raised, hormone free meat. You want to avoid uh, tofu or soy products on a regular basis. There are theories that those have estrogenizing compounds in them. And also staying away from bottled water, which isn't good for the environment anyway. There are a lot of common sense things that men can do, and there are lifestyle factors. What I tell the men who come into my office is, when you come in, it's gonna seem like I take everything you enjoy away. I tell them they've gotta stop smoking cigarettes. They've, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of marijuana use. You've gotta stop smoking marijuana. We know that there are receptors on sperm for both tobacco and cannabis, which is marijuana. In addition, men who drink a lot of alcoholic beverages, I tell them you gotta cut it down to, you know, I I usually recommend that they replace, say, binge drinking with a glass of red wine, which is full of antioxidants, or even grape juice one time per day. Um, the other 
issues that we talk about, obesity, there's definitely a rise in obesity. This is not exclusive to fertility, but it does cause uh, peripheral level, levels of circulating hormones to be much lower in an obese male than in someone who's uh, the normal BMI. So diet and lifestyle play a huge role here. And I, I always tell my patients, you know, you'll know someone who smokes two packs a day and has three kids. But everything affects everyone differently. And so if you're coming in with infertility, we've got to stop the things that we know are toxic. And, and then and what your motivation is, for most of these guys who are young men who don't like to go, seeing, to go see a doctor, they're not used to it, I tell them your motivation is to get me out of your life. And then the, the, the whole process of conception becomes a private one once again, which is where it belongs. So with a little bit of assistance, a little bit of a motivation, that can, be, that can make a, a big difference in these men's lives.